Welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Love and Murder, your weekly true crime podcast where we discuss relationships that turn to murder. And our motto is, you're either someone's last love or their first murder. I'm your host, Kai, and this show discusses true crime cases told in the form of a story with mystery and suspense. Be sure to subscribe to Love and Murder on Spotify, Apple, or whatever platform you're on so you don't miss any of the cases. In today's episode, I'll tell you about a case of a prominent real estate developer and his son who were found shot dead and the wife was gravely injured. Who could have committed such a crime? As we go further into the case, we'll uncover a dark family secret involving the innocent. So... Grab your apple juice, hold on to your butts. But first, I want to remind you to head on over to our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash love and murder. If you're tired of all these commercials and you're tired of this intro, then you can head on over there and get commercial free episodes and intro free episodes, as well as bonuses and so much more. Come on and join us over there as an exclusive lamb. In our last bonus, I discussed a case where a rapist got exactly what he deserved. And in this week's bonus, Shar and I are going to be reviewing a video of a girl who murdered her brother. www.patreon.com forward slash love and murder. I'll tell you a bit more about our Patreon at the end of the episode. In the meantime, let's get into some love and murder. Philip Height was born on September 24th, 1948. He grew up being very involved in the church, and even when he graduated from high school, he began serving on the church council. He was described as a very likable and pleasant person. In the 60s, he met a young lady at a Savannah County Fair. Her name was Linda. Linda says that Philip, quote, stole her heart right away, and they got into a relationship pretty quickly. After a very short relationship, they were married and started a family. Three boys, Philip, but they called him Craig, Chris, and Carrie. Carrie was the baby, and he was born on June 10th, 1976. Around 1967, Philip enlisted in the Georgia National Guard and served for 20 years until he retired in 1987. After he retired, he then moved on to working in real estate. In his community, he became a very respected person, someone that everybody in the community kind of looked up to. So the family was what people, you know, when you look at movies, when you watch movies or you read a book, this is what you think about. You know, three well-behaved kids, a white picket fence, a loving husband, and, you know, just basically stuff that you read about in books that, you know, people wish they had. Philip's real estate business was very important to him. It had become a success to the point that he was known for being a multi-million dollar mogul in his field. In addition to his family and his business, he also raised cattle on the family farm, was a member of multiple associations, and was the president of the Chamber of Commerce. That is pretty impressive. Quote, They are a family that love their family, and I think you can see that throughout the whole Hyde clan. There's a lot of love that goes through them, end quote. Carrie was known to be Philip's favorite son. Maybe it was because they shared the same interests and had very similar habits, but, you know, parents have a favorite child, they just don't tell the other children. I can't tell you for sure I have one child, but I know my mom has a favorite child. She won't admit it, though. 
Carrie even met and married a woman named Robin very quickly, just like his father. Carrie met Robin in high school and was married soon after graduation. The two went on to have three kids as well. Quote, we had a good, prosperous living. He was a very good husband. When he was there, he was a good father, a wonderful father. End quote. He was also the only son to follow in his father's footsteps of going into real estate. Being that he had the backing of his father as well as similar habits, Carrie ended up being very successful in the field and him and his father went into business together, which proved to be a strong and formidable partnership from 1984 to 2004. In 2008, when the recession hit, it hit the family business kind of hard. And then another family tragedy struck. The family had found out that older brother Craig was having an affair with Carrie's wife, Robin. Damn. Who would do that to their own family? At this time, Craig had had two children and was divorced. He was also on disability due to a really bad back injury and living in one of the family's cabins on a hunting club near Oliver. The affair had started in April 2008, and after two weeks, in May by this time, Robin told her husband. They then began marriage counseling. Quote, He said he wished it would have been anyone else except his brother. He said he wasn't going to allow this to happen. He said we were going to work this out. He said Craig would never be a part of the children's lives. End quote. However, even though Carrie knew, Robin kept going with the affair. As a matter of fact, Robin and Craig slept together about 20 times before the affair actually ended. Robin admitted that although she loved Carrie, his work had kept him away more days and nights than not, and she'd been feeling lonely for a very long time. Quote, at that time, I felt Craig was giving me attention Carrie wasn't giving me. End quote. I'm sorry, ma'am. That is not an excuse in my book. She also said that her relationship with Linda also became distant during this time. But through all of this, Robin's affair with Craig continued. What is wrong with this woman? I I don't think this is about being lonely. I really don't because her and her husband are in therapy now. So I'm pretty sure he's given her the time that she's looking for. But she's still having an affair with Craig. Now this continued affair, this pissed Philip off. Quote, The most important thing to him was his family. He always wanted his family to be close to each other. He always wanted his family to love each other. End quote. Philip was pissed at Robin. Quote, Look around you. These are things Carrie can give you. Craig can't. You don't understand him. You don't know how he is. And then Robin responded with, quote, It's not about these things. End quote. But Carrie still loved Robin and was working hard to find a way to fix this. He just wanted to make his family hold again, you know? And Carrie, lovely Carrie, this wasn't your fault at all. I could understand why um, the father was pissed at Robin, but I think he should have also been mad at Craig. But we're just at the beginning. Who knows? Let's see. After dealing with Robin, Philip then had a stern conversation with his son, Craig. He told him that if he didn't stop this affair, he would cut him out of the will and he would inherit nada, nothing. This still didn't stop the affair to the point that Carrie took Robin off of his life insurance as the beneficiary worth $3.5 million and instead put it in a trust for his children. How much do you want to bet that dad, Philip, was the catalyst in this step? He was like, look, Carrie, you better take this woman off your life insurance. You better do it right now because I'm telling you, she's sitting here slapping you in the face, having an affair with your brother. Take her off. She doesn't deserve a red cent. On Saturday, August 23rd, 2008, Robin got ready to go on a night out with some teachers from Boyton Elementary School where she was a teacher's assistant. 
After she left, she found out that the night had been canceled. Now, instead of taking her ass back home, she beelined it to Craig's place and they spent a quote, romantic night together. Now, wasn't she just complaining that her husband wasn't giving her time? Now she has time to go spend with him and she didn't use that time. The next morning, they woke up to a low flying helicopter outside their cabin. And then instead of it moving on, it just kept flying around and around the cabin in very low circles. This sounds like a, some kind of spy movie. That's literally what I would think. Who's spying on you? I would look at him like, who the hell is spying on you? What have you been in? After a while, the helicopter flew away, leaving Robin and Craig confused and annoyed. Quote, it's probably somebody Mr. Phillips had hired to fly over and see if I was here, Robin said. They then proceeded to discuss the situation and how annoyed they were about Philip butting into their business that wasn't his. Totally his business because both his sons are involved. The next day, Robin went home to make lunch for her family and Carrie left to sleep at his parents' house. That's right, Carrie. Chuck her the deuces and go about your business. He planned to come back the next day to take the kids to school. This would have been the first time during their 13-year marriage that he spent the night away from Robin. Robin, being the awesome, attentive, and loving wife that she is, called Craig to tell him that Carrie had left the house for the night. Seriously? At 5 a.m. on August 25th, 2008, Linda woke up to three police officers knocking on her door. When she answered it, officers informed her that Carrie and Philip had been murdered and Linda was still alive but badly hurt. She'd been taken to Memorial University Medical Center in Savannah, Georgia. When officers had gotten to Philip's house, they found Linda conscious and on the floor. She was behind the kitchen table with her cell phone in her hand and this blood-soaked cloth covering a gaping wound on her face and neck. Philip was in the master bedroom, shot in the face with the bed sheet pulled over his head. So it looked like, you know, he was, you know how you just instinctively try and cover yourself with whatever, if you see something being thrown at you, or again, I guess if you see a gun being pointed at you, you just instinctively um, try and protect yourself. So it may not look rational to somebody looking at it, but when you're in a life or death, just instant moment. You just put up your hands to protect yourself. So that's what it appeared he did. And he, his bed sheet was in his hand. So he like pulled it up. So when he died, he died with it over his head. Carrie was still in bed under the covers in a spare bedroom, shot in the face. This person shot all of them in the face, in the face. What the frick? The weapon of choice seemed to be a 12 gauge shotgun. Wow, this individual is insanely crazy. Investigators also smelled gas everywhere, even before they came into the house, as if someone had poured gas all over the house, but nobody had struck a match. So the investigators are thinking that this had to have happened after the murders with as much gas as there was, because if a gunshot had gone off with all that gas in the house, the house would have just gone up in flames. So it seemed like the perp was going to burn down the house with the bodies in it to get rid of evidence, but then they got interrupted. Everyone had been shot from close range, about a two foot distance. So like literally right there. The only thing that saved Linda was that it appears that when the person shot, she turned her head at the, at the last moment and instead of dying, she was in very critical con condition. The bullet had gone through the lower left-hand side of her face and through her right shoulder. So if you think about it, it went in a downwards projection. So it went through the lower left-hand side of her face and through her right shoulder. So think about that, downwards projection so that means the person who did it had to have been taller than her and they were aiming down. Police were wondering, of course, as we all are right now, who did this? And they did ask Robin if her husband had any enemies to which she said that far as she knows, he doesn't. Later that afternoon, she ran to Craig, quote, I walked right up to him and I said, did you do this? 
And he said, I can't believe you would ask me that. I said, I need a yes or no. Did you do this? And he said, no. Linda was in a coma and was the only witness police had. Police still had to conduct an investigation though. And without anything to go on, they turned to the evidence at the crime scene. There were no fingerprints that didn't belong to the family. There were no shell casings that were left behind. But they did find something weird. They did find a key that was still in the door that had opened the back door. Now, the only one who knew where like this spare key was, which was usually hidden in a storage room in the family's carport, were only the family members. Quote, after looking at the scene, it became obvious that the scene was staged. It was meant to look like a robbery. However, nothing was taken of note. There was money left, keys left. Basically, everything was there. Investigators considered if Philip's business connections could be a motive for the murder. Quote, every time Philip had had an argument with somebody... You know, we had to go investigate and talk to those folks, see what was going on with it. End quote. And that was a quote from Sherrick McDuffie. They also considered the neighbors who were suspected of cooking meth. In the end, they found literally nothing. No motive, no suspect, nada, nothing. Sheriff McDuffie got a thought. He remembered a conversation that he'd had with Carrie a month ago. Quote, he knew that his wife was running around on him, but he did not tell me who it was with. Then, at around noon on Tuesday, Robin admitted to investigators that she was, in fact, having an affair with Craig. GBI Special Agent John Barry interviewed Craig and Chris Hyde to see if they had any information. The interview with Craig lasted an hour and a half at the Effingham County Sheriff's Office. In the interview, Agent Barry asked Craig about his affair with Robin. Craig said that he would never betray his brother like that. Are you kidding me? Me? No, that's my brother. But what about her being at his place that Saturday? Well, psh, she needed to take a shower to go to some baby shower or something. So, I mean, what am I supposed to say? No, go home to your own house. I mean, come on. I let her in to take a shower. And that's basically the best he could have come up with. So here's a transcript of part of the interview between Craig and Agent Barry. Craig, I know it looks bad. But I'm going to tell you something. I could never do that to my brother. I could not do that to my brother. Agent Barry, have you ever pulled a weapon at your brother over Robin? No, sir. No, sir. What if I tell you Robin said you've been having sex with her? That's not true, sir. I am being truthful with you. I have not had sex with that woman. I'm just playing. He said, I have not had sex with Robin. She's a liar? No, sir. In your heart, do you think Robin had Carrie killed? N no, sir. There's no way. There, There's no way Robin had anything to do with that. So... What do you think should happen to whoever killed your father and brother? They ought to be executed. I mean, put them away. Put, put them away. And where were you on the night of the murder? I was at home alone watching some fishing and hunting in the rodeo on TV. A month later, Linda woke up from her coma but her jaw was wired shut, which made communicating to investigators difficult and slow. Of course, investigators were hoping that she would be able to identify the shooter, so they were very patient. Painstakingly slowly, Linda's story came out. That night was like every other night except that Carrie had come over and asked to sleep at their house due to a fight with Robin, which, of course, that's their kid, and they hate Robin, so hey, hey, come on, stay. Linda went to her bedroom and was doing a word search 
and had just gone to the bathroom when she suddenly heard this loud noise. At first, she thought that lightning had struck Philip's sleep apnea machine. So she ran out to check and just make sure that like it wasn't catching fire to the room or whatever. That's when she saw Philip was in a pool of blood and she realized that the noise was actually a gun. But before she could do anything, she was shot too. Then she heard the shooter leave the room. So obviously he didn't realize that she was still alive. The phone in the bedroom had no dial tone. So basically the line had been cut. At this point, Linda passed out, but she couldn't remember for how long. When she regained consciousness, she remembered looking down and seeing her teeth on the floor by her side. Oh my God. She also realized that her shirt was wet with something that wasn't just blood. She made her way down to the kitchen slowly and painfully and called 911 on her cell. And that's why police found her the way that they did. Unfortunately, though, she couldn't provide any information on the shooter other than it was a man and he was of slender build. Linda, I didn't see his face or anything. I did not see Craig in that room. I did not see anyone in there. The blast was what I saw. Can you be absolutely certain that it was not Craig? Yes, I can. I know my child. I know the man he is, and I know the heart he has. He does not have a cold-blooded heart. I can be certain that Craig did not do this to our family. Have you ever looked him in the eye and said, Craig, son, did you do this? Yes, I have. And he's looked me right straight in the eye and said, No, Mama, I did not do this. I couldn't do this. The investigation continued, but they started looking at Craig. A colleague of Agent Howard mentioned that with a gun of caliber, the shooter's arm should be bruised up. Quote, Investigator John Bradley with the Sheriff's Department mentioned, I wonder how his arm looks. Typically, that kind of ammo shot from a weapon would leave a bruise. So, Agent Howard asked Craig back to the precinct and asked him to take off his shirt. There were two bruises on his right bicep and one on his left. There were three shots at the home that night, one that killed Carrie, one that killed Philip, and one that wounded Linda, so the bruises were significant. With the type of pressure from this kind of gun, 48 to 50 pounds of recoil on your shoulder, there's no question that the shoulder would be bruised. Craig said, Oh, 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 these bruises. Of course, they're not from a shotgun. I mean, come on now. I know y'all are experts and everything, but, but hear me out, hear me out, hear me out. What had happened was, I slipped in the shower and fell head first over the toilet and got these three here bruises. Now, <laughs> I'm not an investigator or anything, but I don't know how they manage to keep straight faces when they hear stuff like this. Like, I mean, you're not laughing at the murder or th how serious the crime is, but the stories people can come up with that, so you, so you fell in the bathroom went head first over the toilet and literally the only bruises that you had was on one arm. D okay. I mean, to me, I would think you would have more, but that's just me again, I'm not an investigator. So what do I know? So now everything is basically pointing to Craig lying to the police for no reason, the affair, and now the bruises. Not to mention, he was the only suspect they'd spoken to who had no verifiable alibi. However, this was just circumstantial evidence. So to build a stronger case, the GBI kept a watch over Craig and Robin. It was very, very difficult, Robin said. He was being, you know, basically treated as the murderer and me as a conspirator right there along with him. In the meantime, in December... 
Robin and Craig restarted their relationship. Of course they did. First spending time at each other's respective homes, but then in January 2009, only four months after the murder, Craig moved in with Robin. Now keep in mind that Robin still lives in Carrie's house. And Craig just moved into his brother's widow's house with his brother's widow and his brother's children. Not to just sit there and say, hey, I'll take care of the family, but to have sex with his brother's widow under his brother's roof, probably in his brother's bed. What a piece of trash. Here's a quote from Robin. Quote, we had each other. I lost, I lost a lot more than just Carrie. I lost probably every friend I had because of my relationship with Craig. I had a best friend for 15 years and she stayed with me for another month and then she just left. It was very stressful. My family wanted to be there for me, but they didn't approve of the relationship. So at this point, Robin's mother didn't live close by, so she couldn't help her. But at the same time, she didn't approve of her being with Craig. Quote, Craig offered to help with the children and the horses. Dude, you could have done that without him moving in or without sleeping with her if you just wanted to help with the children and the horses. Now, tell me in the comments below, if you had a friend who was acting like Robin, would you stop being friends with her? I just want to know. Although she said she needed help, remember that Carrie had left money for his children through his life insurance policy. The kids would be fine. Robin is the one with no money, which I guess she now found out that she'd been written out of the will now that, you know, the life insurance policy was paid out and she got nothing. As for Robin and Craig, well, they did everything as a family. The only thing is the kids were not aware of the relationship between them, which is good. At this point, Robin said that she was constantly heavily medicated. Quote, I just didn't deal with anything. I just didn't want to deal with the public. I was having a hard time dealing with the guilt I had with Carrie dying so hurt. End quote. Yeah, I mean, I could tell that you're so guilt-ridden, so guilty to the point of still sleeping with Craig. However, the one thing that did come out of all of this, prosecutors now had their motive. What they came up with is that Craig wanted his brother's life, the $3.5 million from the insurance and his brother's wife, and he wasn't above murdering to get it. Quote, He's living in his dead brother's house, sleeping in his dead brother's bed next to his dead brother's wife. He is taking his dead brother's children to school, and he's driving his dead brother's truck. He has become, for all practical purposes, Carrie Hyde. End quote. And Robin had so much guilt that nine months after the murders... Her and Craig discussed marriage, bought rings, and planned to move to Charleston when school was out for the summer. Quote, We did look like a family. We did act everything like a family. We did act like everything was fine, but it was wrong. On the last day of the 2008-2009 school year, Craig was arrested. On December 1st, 2010, the trial of Craig began in Effington Ham County Courthouse. Craig pleaded. What do you think he pled, Lambs? Not guilty. His mother was convinced that her son was innocent and denied any suspicions that she knew anything about the incident. In an interview, Linda stated, quote, As a mother, I could not sacrifice that son that was killed and my husband that was killed to protect another son if I really thought that son did that, end quote. Even Craig's brother, Chris, believed that Craig was not responsible for the crime. Chris believed that walking into a dark home and doing what was done to his family took a coward. Craig, according to Chris, was not a murderer. However, the prosecutors believed that a jury would find Craig guilty. District Attorney Michael Muldrew said in his opening statement, 
when you sit down and dispassionately look at the evidence, it couldn't be anybody but him. Craig's lawyer, Dow Bonds. Wow. I mean, with a name like Dow Bonds, could he have been anything else? I mean, maybe a Bill's bondsman, but he would have totally been something in the law. But anyways, Attorney Bonds' opening statement went like this. What shocked me was just the clear lack of physical evidence linking him to the murders. There's no DNA. There was no fingerprints. There was no eyewitnesses. There were no confessions. His stance was that his client was a genuine person and a gentleman, and there was no clear physical evidence linking him to the murders. The first thing I noticed about Craig when I first met him was what a genuine person he was and what a gentleman he was, end quote. He also stated that the public thought that Craig wanted to be Carrie, which was wrong. Prosecutor Muldrew countered that argument with one of his own, stating that the murders made sense to someone like Craig, if you thought about it like Craig did, quote, the only way I'm going to have Robin Height and have peace is Mama, Daddy, and Carrie have them to be eliminated from the equation. He wanted the big house. He wanted the kids that adored him. He wanted to drive around in that nice truck and the life of leisure of a Southern gentleman, so to speak. Then they began talking about the evidence they'd put together, namely the bruises on Craig's arm. Craig said that he got it from falling, but... The trained medical examiner, Dr. James Downs, testified, I think they're very consistent with someone who has fired a shotgun. They then played a video of Craig reenacting his version of events of how he got the bruises. Now, this video was actually taken before he had lawyered up. So his lawyer said after he saw the video, quote, If I had been representing him at the time, I would have said, you know, don't. A reenactment is not a good idea. But if you look at what Craig was thinking at the time he did that, he was trying to assist them in their investigation. He was cooperating with them. After showing the video, Prosecutor Muldrew said, quote, To have happened like that is truly impossible. Most people that saw it literally laughed at his reenactment he did. It was silly. Craig's brother, Chris, said that the position of the bruises on Craig's body were actually impossible to be made from a shotgun. However, firearms expert Ed Myrick counters saying that a high stress and fast paced situation that this person would have been in, the gun could have slipped without them noticing. Quote, if this gun slips at all, it will fall towards your arm and it will definitely tear you alive. End quote. Prosecutor Muldrew brought up another piece of evidence, the key. He knew something that very few people knew, and this is the location and presence of another key, an outside key, which people commonly have, end quote. In his theory, Craig smashed the pane of glass to make it look like a robbery, but then used the key to open the door and come on in. On his quick escape, because if you remember that we said it smelled of gas, when the police got there, but no fire was set. So that kind of, I don't know about what they thought, but this is what I'm thinking. So personal opinion, that kind of gets me to thinking that he got interrupted, the perp, I'm just saying the perp got interrupted. So in his haste to get away, he forgot to take the key out of the door. So this is why the cops on the scene found, you know, the door as it was with the key in it. Now in a shocking turn of events, but not so shocking to me, given the background of this person, Robin testified against Craig. That woman is all types of pieces of trash. She doesn't stand but by anyone but herself. Like, she's, oh my God, this is narcissistic personality to me, in, in my opinion. Anyway, she said, quote, when I looked at him, I just felt disgust disgust at the affair, disgust at just him, period. I wasn't comfortable with the relationship anymore. How were you not comfortable with the relationship? Seven months ago, you were about to marry him. 
Robin told the court that at one point in time, Craig told her, quote, he said if his father were on fire, he would not urinate on him. He made a comment that if Philip and Carrie were not careful, he would go to school on them. She testified that she really didn't want Craig to move to Charleston with her and the children. And she told others in the community, but she hadn't told Craig yet because she didn't want to hurt his feelings. She also testified that she hadn't been in contact with him since two months after the trial started, which was February. Another person to take the stand was a family friend who testified that one day Craig had come into his parents' home with a gun and confronted Carrie. They then showed the jury pictures of the damage to the home when the two brothers had fought for the gun. And remember the helicopter incident? Well, that was the weekend of the murder, and it came out that Carrie and Philip had gotten a friend, Ellis Woods, to fly over the cabin. Ellis then took the stand and testified that Philip had confided in him that something was ruining his family. He said Philip didn't go into detail, but he could definitely see, you know, Philip was in fact distressed. They asked him to fly over the cabin and take pictures of what he saw. And what he saw was... Craig's and Robin's car in the driveway, and he took pictures of that and gave that to Philip. After that incident, Craig had told his mother that his father was sticking his nose where it didn't belong, and that, quote, if he wanted Robin, he could have her. Prosecutor Muldrew also told the jury that Craig didn't have an alibi for that night. Quote, actually, he was the only one that did not have an alibi. He lied about things he didn't even need to lie about. It's just his character. He also pointed out that Craig lied through the entire interview and when he took a lie detector test. For instance, a question he failed on the lie detector test was, quote, It was something to the effect of, were you holding a shotgun when your parents were killed? And when asked if he had killed his brother and father and shot his mom in the face, Craig's answer was, I don't know. What? What? What kind of... What kind of answer is that? Ha did you kill your father and brother and shoot your mother in the face? And your answer is, I don't know. If you didn't do it, the answer is no. Finally, another important detail to note is that when Linda was still in the hospital and Craig came to visit her, on that day he visited her when he walked into the room and she saw him, her blood pressure shot up from 98 to around 140 and she started shaking and her eyes got really wide. However, Linda interprets that a different way. She says maybe her reaction was due to what she was hearing people say around her, but it wasn't that she was afraid of her son at all. Of course, the defense was that there was no concrete evidence and they relied on the family's testimony to back them up. So, Lambs, I want to hear from you now. What do you think of everything you've heard so far? Like, if you were on the jury, what do you think of everything you've heard so far? You know, was there any hard evidence? No, all circumstantial. But what are your thoughts so far? Just imagine if you were on the jury and you're the one who has to, you know, say guilty or not guilty. Up until this point, what would you think based on what was presented to you? I'd love to hear it in the comments below. Initially, the jury was split for not guilty, eight to four, but after six hours of deliberation, that changed to guilty. He was convicted on 11 counts. Those included two counts of murder, burglary, aggravated battery, aggravated assault, three counts of possession of a firearm in a felony, and attempted arson. Craig received two life sentences for each death, and the judge added 85 years that for the attempted murder of his mother and for other crimes, just as the cherry on top, just F it, whatever, 85 more years. By the way, the trial only lasted two weeks. That's it, two weeks. Craig was sent to a maximum security state prison in Ridsville, Georgia. Robin was arrested in 2010 and charged with threatening a key witness in the trial. What was she, what could she have possibly been threatening them with? She was granted $15,000 bond with the stipulation that she had to move. So she moves to Charleston. 
The court granted both Robin and Linda shared joint custody of the children. In November 2011, she remarried and now goes by Robin Height Cave. In December of 2011, she was arrested again for not giving her children social security payment to Linda, who had temporary custody of them at the time. So basically, I don't know if they do this everywhere. I don't know if it's just here in the U.S., but if a parent dies, their children who are under the age of 18 get paid social security checks from the deceased parent. So that's the money that she was refusing to give to Linda, who had the children at the time. So Robin spent two days in jails for this. Craig, of course, appealed his conviction, but the judge told him to F off in 2013. Well, you know, in terms of the law, what was actually said was that, you know, the convictions were upheld. I prefer F off. The Hyde family still believe Craig is innocent. And that's the case of Craig Height. What do you think about this case? Do you think Craig is innocent or guilty? Do you think that there wasn't enough evidence to convict him? And like I'd asked before, if you were on the jury, what were your thoughts on that? And what do you think of Robin? I'd love to hear what you have to say. You have three ways of sharing your thoughts with me. You can tell me in the comments below. You can join the Lamb Facebook group. It's free and welcoming, and you can discuss the cases with the rest of the Lambs over there. You can also join the exclusive Lamb community here at patreon.com forward slash love and murder. Right now, we have options starting at only $1 a month. And speaking of our Patreon, as I said at the end of the show that I, well, as I said at the beginning of the show, at the end of the show that I'll tell you more about our Patreon, which is for only $1 a month, you get commercial free episodes. You bypass the intro, that long intro where I'm introducing the Patreon and everything like that. So we get directly to the case. Um, all the commercials that were in this episode that you were hearing, you don't get those commercial and you also get additions to the case. So pictures, videos, um, pictures of evidence, whatever else that was added to this case, you get all the additional, um, the additions to the case for all of that right now, you get that at $1 a month. So soon this tier is going up because I was told that that was way too cheap. And right now it's just a dollar. I'm leaving it where it is for now, but it is going to go up. But if you get in now at a dollar, you are grandfathered in even when the prices change. However, the best tier is for $5 a month and above because not only do you get all of these things, but you get bonus episodes. So even when you sign up, like say you signed up for $5 today, you'll get the bonus episode from this week and the previous bonus episodes for that tier. Also in our Patreon, you get access to everything that I post on the web. So whenever I post something to our Facebook group, automatically post it to the Patreon. So you don't have to go all over the web to see everything that I'm posting. You get it right there in Patreon. So there are a lot of benefits of joining that exclusive group. www.patreon.com forward slash love and murder. Come on over. We'd love to have you. Before you go, don't forget to give me a five-star review on whatever platform you're on. That would help me out so greatly, and it takes no time at all. And I thank you in advance. Just go ahead, hit the five-star right now. Just hit five-star, just five-star. Five <laughs> Follow us on social media. All the links are in the show notes below. And, and another easy and free way to help me out is by simply sharing this episode. Share with your mom, share with your husband, share with your brother-in-law, share, 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 share. And as always, I end each episode by reminding you that it's, say it with me now, all love and no murder, y'all. Bye.